We're in the book of Colossians, and we ended last week with the final verses of Colossians 1, verses 28 and 29. Him, Jesus, we proclaim, warning everyone and teaching everyone with all wisdom, that we may present everyone mature in Christ. For this I toil, writes the Apostle Paul, struggling with all his energy and that he powerfully works within me. And I identify with those verses, and I wonder if you do too. We proclaim Jesus, and I love that testimony you just shared, Carlos, giving a bit of the reason why. Why do we go to all this effort, getting a new building ready, taking a major step of faith? Why? Why not just keep our faith private? See, it's because there is a warning in living life without him. And because in him there is wisdom that I believe, I'm sure you do too, that everyone needs to know. There's so much hurt and brokenness and chaos. And much of it is because people just don't know these things. It's therefore toil for us, work and effort as we seek by the power of his energy to work powerfully in this work for the benefit of ourselves and others. And I like how you ask the Holy Spirit for tips because it's his power, it's his insight that brings out that wisdom that only God can provide for us for the benefit of ourselves and others, right? And it's a wonderful calling and something that we as a church community have sown so much so far into, given the past few years to, which is finally, hopefully, going to be kicking into something like second gear. And some cars, if you remember the old manual cars, who here still drives a manual? Oh, good on you. A couple of you. Um, You got, what, five or six gears or something? I'm believing that we're about to hit second gear, not just out of five or six, but maybe one of those 18 or 23 speed or whatever they have on the big tracks, or more than that. I'm believing for a lot from what God is going to do, because it's in him and it's in his power, not in our own abilities. Thank God for that. God has great purposes for us that we haven't yet begun to realize. As Ephesians 3 Verses 20 and 21. Um, Now to him who is able to do far more abundantly than all we ask or think, according to the power at work within us. To him be glory in the church and in Christ Jesus. And then you have a few words here that I hadn't seen before. Throughout all generations. The church is still advancing. God has purposes for us today in this generation this week, this month, this year. We've held on in faith in this place here in the knowledge that God has called us and wants to work powerfully within us and each and every one of us. He's got his purposes for us and his purposes for the world, but he also has his plans for each one of us, doesn't he? And we have a vision of seeing many young people in particular. No offense to those of us who are are heading towards the second half of life or whatever it might be, but we believe especially that God is calling us to reach out to the people who aren't yet present right here. The young people whose lives can be changed, just like Carlos's life was completely changed. And not just his own life, but the generations to follow will be impacted by that decision that he made. And my father sharing a brief testimony as well. My life would be completely different. And therefore, you would all be doing something different this morning, wouldn't you, had that not happened? And we believe that God is calling us to reach out because there just aren't enough people hearing. And that's all it took for you was to hear. And God did the rest. And in turn, these people will reach out to other people like Carlos has, like my dad has, because they've been changed by God. And we believe that God is calling us to have an impact. I'm not going to make some crazy big statement like we're going to change the nation, but we want to. You know, we want to reach people that they would reach other people and that we would see societal change 
whether it's just in little pockets, whether it's just in families or in communities. We want to see change. That's our goal, and it's no small dream. Only God could do it, and that's the thing that excites me about it. The pressure kind of comes off because we know that it's God. He's got to do it or not do it. It's up to him. Of course, we have to be obedient. We have to allow him to fill us and lead us by his spirit. But no amount of effort could achieve it if we didn't have him. With all of that said, let's get into the second chapter of the letter to the church in Colossae. The first point I want to bring up is dogged determination. Oh, a blank page. Colossians 2, verses 2 to 4. That their hearts may be encouraged, being knit together in love, to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom, the hidden, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. I remember when I was in my teens being so certain that I would always be a Christian. That is, I would always follow God no matter what. In my imagination, I had these gory thoughts of the end times and being tortured to death and what temptations might come to give God up. And I thought, I don't know how I'm going to do it, but I'm going to stick with him no matter what. And I remember talking with a friend who also appeared to have a strong conviction as a Christian at the time, but he wasn't quite so certain that he would always be a Christian. No matter how strong his conviction was then, he was like, well, you know, I, I, I can't say for certain that I still will be in 30 years' time. He was definitely a Christian at the time, but he no longer is. And I came across a video a few years ago, which talked about how being 90% committed to something is far more difficult than being 100% committed. You see, if you're like Lot's wife in the Old Testament and you're walking away and you're walking towards your new goal, your new destination, and you turn back for a moment to have a look, you're constantly wondering whether you've made the right decision. Well, she turned into a pillar of salt, it says. You'll be distracted from your purposes in God and you may get lost or worse yet, like her, turn into a pillar of salt. I'm kind of hoping that you'll look over your shoulder, Carlos, and end up coming back, but anyway. Now, God bless you in the way that he wants to bless you. So imagine you're setting out on an adventure and you've got an idea of your destination, Right? But then you just keep getting distracted along the way. You think, oh, that's fun. That's fun. And I just feel like that's how a lot of people live their lives. They might start out with some sort of conviction, but then they wander away when something that is apparently better at the time comes along. And many years down the road, and they're nowhere really, I had a friend who went over to Western Australia to gain um, in his early 20s from the big boom that was happening in these crazy wages that were, they were throwing around. And he went to get a house deposit and he came back and he bought a house and then he sold that one a few years later and made a big profit and he lives in a much nicer house now. But he decided at the beginning he'd only do it for one year. And uh, when he came back, I asked him why he decided that and he said, well, once he'd got there, he realized there are a whole lot of people and they went there for a purpose to save up for a house deposit or whatever. But a lot of people just stayed and some people had been there for th- something like 20 years. And he said they'd earn tons of money because they'd work for like three weeks in a row and then have a week off. They'd earn this money up and then they'd go to Thailand, spend it on prostitutes and all that kind of stuff and waste it all away and they'd just do that over and over again. And they never went anywhere. They, they went for a purpose but they got distracted by all this other stuff and never achieved the goal they set out for in the first place. And I appreciated his wisdom in sticking with that conviction and saying, you know, one year, that gives me this much. Two years would give me this much. Three years would give me even more, but, you know, I might get distracted and lose it along the way. I'm just going to stick with that one year, come back and achieve what I said I was going to do. 
But see, many people fail to reach their destination. So why is it? Their conviction wavers. Why does it do that? You know, maybe. Maybe they get disillusioned, burnt out, exhausted. Or they change their mind along the way. Or they get tired of traveling alone on a path they feel everybody else disrespects. But a conviction should be something that remains regardless of these things. Right? Of course, a conviction must be founded on truth. So if you find out that it's no longer true, that's a different story. But it must be able to withstand the temptation to give up and choose an easy life instead. For me, I made this decision early on that I would be 100% committed or that at least I would be committed for 100% of my life. I was sure, but I decided not to be dogmatic about it. I decided not to be 100% sure about everything I thought about God, but to be sure that God was there. And if I did find God to be unreal, then I would accept that fact and ditch the idea. Like I had this funny idea, like, you know, let's say that everything that we read about in the Bible, it's all true and it all makes sense, but it is some sort of projection. And if I could see behind that projection that there was another reality like aliens or whatever it is, and I could understand how within that reality it made sense, but outside of that reality it wasn't true, then I I would walk away. I mean, that's highly unlikely. Um, But if there was something that proved beyond all doubt that God wasn't real, I would would walk away, you know. But within that, I decided to be committed for my whole life. But, you know, there's a difference between having doubts and allowing the whole thing to unravel piece by piece. Many times I'd go onto YouTube and watch videos by ardent atheists and um, with their strong rhetoric and almost for a moment, within like an hour or two, become convinced and see their side of the argument and, and almost become convinced that God didn't exist by their plausible arguments, as the Apostle Paul calls it. But then I'd take a step back and I'd remember what God had done in my life and the strong arguments for his existence. And then I would find actually going through this exercise of temporarily suspending my belief and and working through these doubts, I'd come out even stronger in my conviction than before because I'd endured some sort of testing and found an even stronger argument for God in myself. Now, I'm not recommending that for everybody. It could be dangerous to go and try and find all the arguments against God for you. But for me, it was part of my journey. And all of this is to say that while I have a dogged determination to remain a Christian, it's not through blind faith or naivety. It's through conviction based on the experiences, the rationale, and the wisdom of God that I have witnessed. No rival philosophy for living, for me, even comes close. I don't feel like I have to go and experience all the other options and live a year as a Muslim and a year as a Buddhist and a year as whatever it is that people believe today, just drifting through life. Because if I just weigh up the rationale for them, I find that none of them really comes close anyway, so why would I go and experience and practice what doesn't stand up in theory. But does that mean that I've never changed my idea on scriptural interpretation or anything like that? Absolutely, I've changed my mind on a lot of things. There are many things that I used to believe that I no longer do, and I've changed my perspective on a lot. And having been very black and white as a child, I no longer have such a strong viewpoint on many of the peripheral issues. but I'm even more certain on the ones that do matter, the core tenets of our faith. And I'm convinced that God is real and that my life should be lived in light of that fact. In verses six to seven, 
It says, Therefore, as you received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk in him. Rooted and built up in him and established in the faith. Established, like planted in it. Just as you were taught, abounding in thanksgiving. So my advice, if you want it, if you're unsure about God and whether or not you want to be a Christian, that's fine. Take all the time you need to determine whether it's the truth or not. But once you've decided, commit and never look back. The Apostle Paul wrote that we should be rooted and built in him and established in the faith, abounding in thanksgiving. So firstly, we need dogged determination. Second, we should be abounding in thanksgiving. I'm trying to teach myself to be more grateful. My dad's smiling in the front row. To have less unrealistic expectations of myself. I think I'm reasonably good at that. But also of life. I used to be very disappointed when the weather wasn't perfect. Now I expect rubbish weather. But actually I've gone from being a bit of a pessimist to more of an optimist. Which sounds counterintuitive. As you see, I used to complain every day the weather was bad and take for granted the good days. Now, I expect it to be rubbish, so if it's better, it's a positive. And so now, instead of complaining when it's bad, I talk about how glorious it is when it's good. And another change that I've made recently is acknowledging my inherent clumsiness. Who here is clumsy? <laughs> Trish is laughing at me because... Is anyone here gluten-free, by the way? The brownie is usually gluten-free, but I spilt pastry all over it this morning because I brought the um, Pastor Paul's away in Australia having a, an 18-day cruise around from Perth all the way over the top and back to Sydney and then back home again, which sounds fantastic. I hope he has good weather. Um, but I had to bring the savouries and the brownie, and I was busy and rushing this morning, so I put them in the same box, and Trisha just laughed at me and laughed and laughed because there was pastry all over the brownies, and she said, the presentation isn't very good, and I don't know, whatever. I'm trying to be less of a perfectionist, so whatever. But yeah, I've, I've come to this realization, and I don't know if it's something that's just happened in the last few years, that I've suddenly become clumsy, or whether I always was. <laughs> you probably know better. Um, but maybe it's because I'm getting older, and my body's not working the way that it used to. Or maybe it's because I'm getting older, and therefore more experienced, and think that I should be better at things, and then I start to do things like multitask. Instead of just doing one thing properly, I do two things poorly. And I attempt and I mess up. And here's an example from a few weeks ago. I poached some eggs. They were in a, um, my wife has taught me this um, method for poaching eggs where you get a bowl, you put some water in it, you put the eggs in, and then you put it in the microwave. I know it sounds terrible, but it's pretty good for just, you know, when you want standard poached eggs rather than perfect poached eggs. And it comes out pretty good. But I took this bowl with these poached eggs in it, um, and I took the eggs out, and I put it on my avocado toast, and I was carrying that. And, and you'd think a normal person would put that on the table and then go and do something else. But on the way, I saw that a towel needed to be moved or something silly like that. So I did that while holding this, and then I looked down, and these eggs and avocado toast and everything was like stuck between me and the bench and about to fall onto the ground. And normally, I'd do something silly like throw it at the ground and make it worse and yell and get angry. But then I thought, you know what? I'm clumsy. Of course this was going to happen. You know, so I have now, instead of getting angry about it, I have now decided that I'm allowed to be clumsy one to two times a day. You know, and then if you think of a bell curve, you've got like, you know, zero down here and four here. 
most of the experiences of my life will be one to two clumsy things per day. Sometimes I might one day have a day where I don't do anything clumsy. Uh, but sometimes there'll be three or four things, you know. So I'll expect one to two, maybe three to four, and try not to get angry when I do something stupid. And actually, it's working. I'm having way less tantrums about stupid things that I think I'm too good to do. And it's amazing how much better our life can be when we take that pressure off and we just start being grateful to God for what we do have rather than annoyed about what we don't. And things like thanksgiving and adjusting our expectations are actually really easy once we decide to do them. And they're free ways of improving our outlook in life. So dogged determination, abounding in thanksgiving, and thirdly, buried in baptism. I was clearing out my email inbox the other day, and I came across some photos of a friend's baptism. I was in a rock pool in rural Hokianga, up north on a beautiful beach with no one else around. In the sunshine, surrounded by good friends on a mission trip. It was about as good as life can get. But baptism is more than a ritual or a happy experience. It's kind of like a flag on the top of a summit or on the moon. It's like a stake in the ground. Like marriage, it's a lifelong commitment. One that a person makes to always remain in faithful service to God, no matter what comes along. I can't imagine how much more difficult my life would be as a Christian if I'd been flaky in my belief. Likewise, my relationship with my wife. When we were newly married and We were just starting to figure out what it was to be married. We often commented to each other how beneficial it was to be committed. We weren't in the early stages of a relationship trying to decide whether we still wanted to continue. We naively, with rose-tinted glasses on, decided that it would be great to be stuck together for the rest of our lives. And when doing things like learning how to be sexually intimate, or stuff like that, I can't imagine how awful it would have been if we hadn't been committed to each other? Wouldn't we have felt like we were on trial when we didn't know the person was going to stick around no matter how good we were or how bad we were? And they could walk away any time they liked. And many times when it's been immensely difficult dealing with running a church, having a young family, keeping a business going through lockdown and through recession and all that kind of stuff, all the stresses and everything, and the health challenges for me and other people. I've been so glad that I committed to Sarah for life. And leaving is not an option for me, and even better, thankfully, is not an option for her. Of course, if a person's in an abusive relationship or is being betrayed by another partner, there's always ways out. I'm not saying stick to something that's really, really damaging. But God's ideal is a lifelong commitment and fidelity. And even more so when it comes to committing to Jesus. Because my marriage will only last until one of us passes on. But that relationship with God will last forever. And unlike myself or even my wife, and this may come as a surprise to you like it did to me, who is imperfect, Apparently, unlike us and our imperfections, God is perfect, always, and he never fails, and commitment to him, therefore, will never backfire. There are always challenges, but they always have the promise of working out eventually to our benefit. And even if they didn't, as we saw last week, we have the promise of a renewal of all creation as it says in Colossians 1, verses 19 to 20. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell, and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross. 
But back to baptism in, verse, in chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. In him also you were circumcised with a circumcision made without hands by putting off the body of the flesh, by the circumcision of Christ, having been buried with him in baptism, in which you were also raised with him through faith in the powerful working of God who raised him from the dead. And you who were dead in your trespasses and the uncircumcision of your flesh, God made alive together with him, having forgiven all our trespasses by cancelling the record of debt that stood against us with its legal demands. This he set aside, nailing it to the cross. And we're going to sing about that in a moment. But here's the point. Being a Christian is not about doing things to earn God's love. I love that testimony, Carlos, as you said. That's how many people live, trying to earn God's love. How could you do that? You clumsy, imperfect, ungrateful sod. I'm talking to myself. God's love already exists and cannot be increased or decreased by our actions. He's the perfect father. So it's not about doing things to earn something that is already freely given. And when we acknowledge the love of God in our lives and decide to commit to lifelong service to him, we essentially choose to die. Our life is no longer ours. And that's where that 100% commitment comes in. You can't do it with 90%. Actually, it's easier with 100. So we're buried with him in baptism. And that's why we go under the water. And for a moment, if we weren't raised again, We'd be gone. We'd be dead. Yesterday I was at the swimming pool. And in the toddler pool, there's different parts. There's a bit about that deep and a bit about that deep and a bit about that deep. And um, there was a lady there with twins. And before that, there were the twins and the older sister. And her and her husband or partner or whatever were there. So there were four eyes looking after three children and it was safe. But then when the partner and the older child had gone, there was her and her two children. And one of them was here, standing by the slide, a little bit upset, and so she walked away from this one here for a moment. And she's about two-thirds of the way to this one, and she goes, remembers, oh, I've got another child, looks back, and the water's about here, and the child's going. And she rushed over and saved the life of that one. And when we're baptized, it's kind of like this. We're put under the water and we die. Like Jesus for a moment buried in the tomb. But we don't stay that way. The very next words of Paul are that we're raised just like Jesus. So lastly, raised in resurrection. We once walked in darkness as uncircumcised, Paul puts it which is the cultural context that the Jews had 2,000 years ago. They believed that you had to keep the Old Testament law to be righteous. But Paul pointed out that righteousness is not in ourselves, but in Jesus. We identify with him in death, and we're raised with him in life. He cancels the debt we owe and nails it to the cross. I like that it's really certain imagery. It's not like he, he put it up with a little piece of tape on the cross. He nailed it. He hammered it in. So if we're free of our sin and debt, then the way we live is as a new creation. Get the order. We don't live as a new creation to get the righteousness. We live that way because of the righteousness. We live in light, shunning the things that would drag us down and back to the ways of death. Once you've come up out of the water, you don't want to go back below it again, do you? I've already mentioned that I've known many people with a real faith who have let the conviction waver and have fallen away. I believe it's possible to lose your salvation. I was going to talk about the theological reasons for that. There's a verse in Colossians 1, 21 to 23, but you can read it later if you want. It says, if indeed you continue in the faith. But anyway, we must remember that there are three stages to salvation. There's, I have been saved. Jesus died for me. 
I accepted his life as a substitute for mine and died with him in baptism. It's historical. It's in the past. And that's why these verses are in the past tense. It says, you were circumcised. You having been buried, you were raised. And then secondly, there's I am being saved. And we call this sanctification. And it's the process of becoming Christ-like in life. It's the power of God that transforms us now in the decisions that we make daily or moment by moment to choose life over death, spirit over flesh. And lastly, there's the future element. I will be saved if I continue in the faith. So you could at one time have been saved, been going through this process of sanctification, and then yet fall away and fail to be saved for eternity. But that's where the conviction and dogged determination come in. We must commit ourselves for the whole of our lives to receive the full benefit of being a Christian. And the Apostle Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15, 17 to 19, and if Christ has not been raised, your faith in, is futile, and you're still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only, we of all people are to be pitied the most. Of course, sanctification is a good thing. Being like Jesus in this life has some benefits. Personally, I think that those benefits are more for others than they are for myself. It's good for you, then I'm sanctified. It's pretty good for me, but it's really good for you. What do I mean by that? I mentioned last week the difference between those who live God's way and those who don't. I think the difference is most evident a couple of generations later. There are those who have dysfunctional families where pain and abuse are perpetuated. The tough times seem to overwhelm them. Then there are those who are blessed beyond belief, whose grandparents seem to have brought some blessing upon their children and grandchildren, and the family seems to have something that others are missing. And I can speak from experience, my own family being like that. Now, I don't mean to paint a black and white picture just says it's always good this way and it's always bad that way. Of course, there's much more to it. There's genetics, finances, opportunity. But what I'm trying to say today is that we seem to have a very short-term view of things. We just think about the effect of my action now on how it's going to affect me later today or this week or even for the rest of my life. We think that our lives are just about ourselves. Even marriage is a short-term or medium-term arrangement that can be broken off at any point. But that way of living can't result in the latter example. It just can't result in those generations being blessed. If you don't want that, fine. It's your life, you can do what you like. I'm not telling you you have to live my way. But if you do want that, you have to live God's way. And if you don't believe that the children you've had or grandchildren, those nasty little blighters ought to benefit from you and you want to spend every bit that you've got left on yourself, that's fine. It's totally up to you. You don't have to pass on any blessing to the generations after you. You can live selfishly and choose to die as soon as your life starts to lose the gloss. There's really, in that case, not that much benefit in living a sanctified life. If life is only about sanctification, then you might as well live as loosely as you wish. But life is all about others. And they benefit from our sanctification a lot. We might benefit subtly. But we benefit overtly and beyond comparison when we endure to the end and we receive a reward. And what a shame it is to do it in the past and in the present and not benefit in the future. So 1 Corinthians again as we wrap. This time it says in chapter 2 verse 9 in the New Living Translation. No eye has seen nor ear has heard and no mind has imagined what God has prepared for those who love him. God is good. All the time. All the time. 
Let's close our eyes and bow our heads. God, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you came as a man. You didn't send somebody else with the message. You came and you lived and you died and you rose again. The whole story just works. We thank you for the blessings we have in Christ, that we're called children of God, that we're co-heirs with you. We thank you for your wisdom, for the warnings in your word and the wisdom and the blessings that we have in you. Lord, we ask that you'd give us that dogged determination, that you'd help us to abound in thanksgiving, that we'd identify you in you with that moment of death to ourselves that enables us to live 100% committed when we're raised again in Christ. Help us all to go from this place this morning with a new spring in our step, with a gratefulness that we didn't have before, with an acknowledgement of our frailty that doesn't hurt us or hinder us, but helps us to rejoice more in you. Lord, bless everyone here abundantly, beyond what they could imagine. In Jesus' name, amen.